Well, good morning, church. Let's take our Bibles. Thank you. And let's go to Psalm 121. Psalm 121, as you're flipping there, I'm excited about our family meeting. As soon as uh, our worship gathering is over with, we'll dismiss for, uh, for a few minutes and then come back in here. And um, We call it a family meeting because if you're a, a covenant member here at Cross Point, you're part of a family, part of the family of God across every tongue, tribe, and nation, but the local expression of that here at, at Cross Point Church. And, and we know some, some of you um, have been coming maybe months, and uh, you're not a member yet. Throughout um, the year, uh, throughout the normal year, at Cross Point, we will offer a membership class called Starting Point, our, our uh, kind of the reboot of our church membership. We've, we went through that in February, and, uh, and so, you know, when we offer the next Starting Point, we'll let you know. And if we always say, you know, church membership is not only a commitment, but it's a call. God calls people to partner together, and as our mission statement says here, we exist to glorify God by committing ourselves to God's truth, God's people, and God's mission. So I'm excited today about what we're going to vote on at our family meeting and, uh, and what's next for, for Cross Point. Psalm 121, uh, we'll read it in just a second. Hey, pray for me and pray for our students uh, Wednesday night. Uh, we're going to have a back-to-school rally for the entire county. It'll be at West Ellisville Baptist Church. I'll be, I'll be sharing the word that night. It should be a great night um, as, as uh, student ministries from all over our county, including our students here at Cross Point take part in that. Psalm 121, second of the Psalms of Ascent, and as Justin shared with us last week, these 16 Psalms from Psalm 120 until Psalm 130, or 15 I should say, till Psalm 134, are in the mind of going to Jerusalem to worship. When the Lord was given his commands to Moses in Exodus 23, as they were setting up, they weren't living in the land of Israel yet, but Israel is not just a country in the Old Testament, it's a covenant people with God. And we find out in the New Testament that we've been grafted in and included in that. But in the Old Testament, three times a year, Exodus 23 tells us that the Jews were to present themselves to the Lord. And of course, later on, this became um, when, the, when the temple was built in Jerusalem, and it was at, at Passover, which is... March, April, it was at, at Pentecost, seven weeks later, the Feast of Weeks, which was about seven or, or eight weeks, and then it was in the fall in Tabernacles. And so this is the, the context of these Psalms of Ascent. The community of God, the people of God are gathering together at Jerusalem to worship. Justin took us last week how, and showed us last week how they begin in Psalm 120 with some almost despair and a downward depression as you look around and see everything that's going on, but they have an upbeat tone as you get, it's almost as the pilgrim gets closer to Jerusalem, guess what? They stop looking at what around them causes them dismay and begins to, to see and focus clearly on the Lord. Let's read the, the psalm together. Psalm 121, verses 1 through 8. A song of ascents. I lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. If last week was the beginning of the pilgrimage towards Jerusalem, the psalmist's concern here is for protection in the pilgrimage, protection in the journey. God, you've called me to go do something. God, you've called me to go somewhere. God, you've called me to gather with your people at Jerusalem three times a year. And Lord, on that journey, there will be perils. There'll be dangers. And Lord, I'm asking you for protection. Eight years ago, there was a group from this local church that was sent to work uh, with me and some of our guys in North India. And literally, we just hiked through villages and we, uh, we, were, we were sharing with people, with our Indian brothers and, and sisters. And there was one point where we were trying to cross, uh, we were trying to go up a mountain and we were trying to cross over. And we started in the afternoon, 
And lo and behold, I still think to this day, providentially, as we were going up this, uh, this you know, pretty, pretty uh, inclinous route, Dr. Loach, you were there, along came two trucks. And, of course, the, uh, the, the pragmatist American mindset says, man, maybe we can slip these people some, some rupees and they'll just, you know, we can just bum a ride up, up the side of the mountain. So we did. Now, one, this is important for, for this, this story. Dr. Loach, Casey Hicks, and Slade Hicks were in a covered bed where all of our luggage was. The rest of us, including all of our Indians and brothers and sisters, were in the back of one that was uncovered. Well, it starts raining, and then it starts snowing. And of course, we're, we're grabbing hold of this, uh, this bar in the back, in the back bed of the truck, and because it's pretty rough going. And at one point, John Stockstill looked up in the middle of the snow and said, this is the greatest moment of my life. It was all good until the road got really bad. We had to get out a few times because it was just really precarious. So we get, we get to where we're going, where we can, they've, they've given us a ride up, but kind of the last turn going up is really steep. There's Casey, Casey, you remember this, that's right. So in order to get a running go up the mountain, and we're at, you know, we're at probably five, 6,000 feet, Blake, you were there, you remember this, yeah. I'm just, they're, they're just all coming to me as I look around the room. So we have multiple witnesses, so this is a fact. And so in order to get momentum going up the hill, they had to back the truck up to this ledge. And I don't know, it was a 500,000-foot drop-off. Well, the, the first truck to attempt it was the one with the covered bed where Dr. Deloach and Casey and Slade Hicks were in it. And no lie, there was an extended bed on the truck. And right before, so, so they, they have to back the truck up, and this is what happened. The bed of the truck extended over the edge of the cliff, in which were Mark Deloach, Casey Hicks, and Slade Hicks. Casey looked at us and said, hey guys, I'll see y'all in heaven. That's exactly <laughs> what he said. Backed up to the edge, and man, they gunned it, and everybody got up safe. But I always remember that moment. You know, it was just like in that moment, it's like, okay, Lord, you've got to take care of this or not. And what was amazing was even the next day, we had a divine appointment on top of the mountain. We, we gave uh, a priest a copy of, of the scriptures. We shared the gospel. It was, it was incredible. When I think about that, there was a destination, there was an aim, there was a goal, and yet we were moving towards it. At the same time, I would tell you to obey God and to honor him with your life, there will be peril along the way. Anyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, the scripture says. And when we start thinking of this hymn, this song, this psalm, what comes over and over and over again, six times in eight verses, is this word, keep. And then King James, keepeth, preserve. The New American has keeps, protects, guards. The New Living has watches over. The Christian Standard Bible has protects or protector. Let me define this word for you because the title of the message today is the God who keeps. When we think of Psalm 121, this is the ministry and work of God that he keeps us in the midst of a pilgrimage in the midst of our life, in our response, in obeying him to what he's told us to do, the God who keeps. If you'll notice in verse 3, he who keeps you will not slumber. Verse 4, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Verse 5, the Lord is your keeper. Verse 7, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. The repetition in the psalm of that word is telling us what the psalm is about. And the truth is, praise God for the fact that our salvation and our Christian life is not based in us keeping ourselves. It is his, his grip upon us keeping us until the very end. So let's, as we jump in, I want to define this word for you because some translations use keep, some are, as, as I just told you, protect, preserve. It is the Hebrew word, Shamar. And this is what it literally means. It can mean to have charge of, to, to watch, 
to keep eye on, to preserve, to, to care for. So you see why the English uses different words in different translations, and even some translations, same Hebrew word, but just to get the holistic picture, they'll use keep, protect, guard. I love this other kind of longer description of the word, to maintain or to observe something for a purpose. Now kind of the, in your mind is, The difference between somebody that is paid because it is their job to look out for something or someone, or on the other hand, somebody that keeps watch and protects and guards because it is their duty because of a relational connection to that which is being guarded and watched and protected. See the difference? Jesus said this in the New Testament, John 10. He said, when the wolf comes, guess what? The hireling, what does he do? See y'all, I ain't getting eaten up. But what's the shepherd do? The shepherd sticks behind and fights the wolves and even lays down his life. Why? Because he loves the sheep. And so this word, the central point of this psalm, is telling us that what God does in keeping us, in protecting us, in guarding us, is not because it, he, somebody's paying him to do that and he could care less about it. What you find in this text is that God keeps us on the basis of his love for us. Nobody forces God to do this. Nobody hires God to do this. And praise God, nobody can talk God out of doing this. This is what he does for his people. If you look, if you look at the psalm, Verses 1 and verse 2 are kind of in the first person, and then it seems as in verse 3 to verse 8 that there's another voice that comes in. So so I'm lifting up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? And then it's you, you, the Lord's going to do this. And and different commentators have, have thought it may mean different things. It could be that, as we've looked at in different psalms, it could be that the psalmist is saying something, and then he steps aside and almost like preaches to himself. We've seen that in the scriptures, haven't we? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. And that may be what's happening here. It could be because it's a pilgrimage that the psalmist is thinking in mind, he's not like flying Han Solo on the way to Jerusalem. He's got people around him. They're going together. And so guess what? As they journey to Jerusalem, what are they doing? I'm saying something, and then someone beside me who's in this pilgrimage with me is saying something to me to encourage me. Other people have said it might possibly be a a priest or a song leader that that is encouraging the believer. For whatever it is, over and over again is the reinforcement of the fact that God keeps us. One commentator said this way, protection is a burning issue for a pilgrim who is traveling through lonely countries. And you and I inevitably will come to the place where we feel like we're all alone, where we feel like everything's over our head, where we feel like it's impossible for us to go through, and that is where we bring Psalm 121 to our hearts, and we understand where our help comes from because he keeps us. Three truths this morning. First truth is this. We must admit our need. What is our need? We need keeping we need protection, and we need help. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? The psalmist opens up the psalm and says, hey, (laughs) I need somebody to protect me. I need somebody to keep me. I need somebody to watch over me. He acknowledges that he needs help. He admits that his need is to be kept. He admits he cannot keep himself. Why is he asking this question, where does my help come? I lift up my eyes to the hills. So if you didn't know this, Jerusalem is surrounded by elevated points. And that's why you, and and particularly the temple, that's why you read in the Old Testament about them going up, ascending, because literally you're walking up. This is and the topography of the region. If you look at it, it says that somebody went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's not because they're going south. It's because of the elevation change. And I think it's, my Old Testament professor would, would beat me up if I get this wrong. But, you know, it's something like 
maybe 1,500 or 2,000 feet difference in elevation as you go down from, from Jerusalem. So, so the pilgrim approaching Jerusalem is naturally, in most places, it is an, an elevation climb. And so when we think about the hills and our need for help, what possibly might cause him, as he looks to the hills, to request for help? Instantly, my mind went to the parable of the Samaritan, right? He's on his way down from Jerusalem. He's going the opposite way. And what happens in that story of the Good Samaritan? He gets jumped, right? Gang of robbers jumps him, strips his clothes off, steals his money, and leaves him for dead. And in ancient times, of course, out in the boonies like this, robbers, maybe wild animals, would wait upon someone coming along or a group of people coming along. So he might be asking for help because there is a negative here. It could be the fact that as he looks up and he sees the hills, he realizes how small he is, and so therefore his mind instantly goes to the one who can help him. And who is that? In verse 2, my help comes from the Lord. The Hebrew here for help is a word called azer. It's found 65 times in the Old Testament. Most of the cases, it refers to majestic help. Like, when it happens, you're like, only God can do that. Like, you can't even take credit for it. Men, you, you mow your grass, and you sit back on the front porch, and you look out, and, you know, my dad used to do that. I used to ride on lawnmower with my dad, and my dad would say, he would say, son, one day all this will be yours. And what he meant was not that I was going to inherit the land, but I was going to be the one to cut the grass on the land, right? The responsibility <laughs> was being handed off to me. But that, that satisfaction of looking out and saying, I did this. And so what he's doing is he's looking at these mountains and these hills, not just saying, I might fight, fight, find danger in these mountains or hills, but I know the one who made these mountains and hills, and he's greater than anything that's in these mountains and hills. This is an old preacher axiom, but let me tell you something. Everything, every situation, every problem in your life that is over your head is under the feet of King Jesus. The worst day of your life is still a day that he is sovereign and reigning and Lord over. And so he says, I need help. This word, azer, help, it can conveys the idea that unless God rules and reigns, we're in trouble. But the idea that it's God that gives the help, nobody else can take the credit for the help. As, as, as we look to see how God intervenes in our life, guess what? Only he can get the credit for it. Can I ask you a question? And let me ask it to myself first. What are you asking God for in your life to happen that when it happens, he would be the only one to get the credit for it, right? Like, so much of what we do as the American church can be explained by us, you know? So much of, I think, what we experience in the Christian life can be explained by us. Praise God that God moves in the mundane and God moves in the normal and the ordinary. But the kind of help the psalmist is asking for here is, this is out of my league. This isn't in my pay grade. God, you're going to have to come through. And the point of that is he looks away ultimately from the biggest things around him to God alone who is greater than all things. It's interesting that he, what he says about God in verse 2, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth, the maker of these mountains, the maker of these hills. Who God? Who's God? He made all these things that overwhelm me. This actual phrase, who made heaven and earth, was taken by the early church, and this is how God is identified in the Apostles' Creed, right? I believe in God the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. This reminder that the God that we're dealing with is not a God that somebody took Plato and or, or wood or, or silver or gold and fashioned it and carried it around. On that trip that I was telling you guys about earlier, we, we saw a parade of people coming down the mountain. 
And they, had, they were carrying something, and we found out they had to go to the top of the mountain and get an idol and put the idol on uh, something to, like, to, to carry it on. And they brought it down because somebody in one of the villages below was sick. And so that idol couldn't come down. It couldn't walk, so they had to go get it. Aren't you thankful for a God who at the same time is not just on the mountaintop, he's in the valley, and he's everywhere in between, right? This is who he is. He looks away from the hills of fear and difficulty and instead looks to the Lord. And I think it's important for us to see the uncertainty, the need for help in this passage is not because of disobedience on the part of the psalmist, it's because of obedience. I got to leave my house and go to Jerusalem, right? Who told me to do that? God. So the precarious situation comes about because I'm obeying God, not because I'm not. Please, this this idea in us that if we obey him, all has to be well, that's not what's found in Scripture. You talk to our brothers and sisters around the world, it seems like their lives started getting crazy when they followed Jesus. Not before, because. And some of you have been in that place where you feel that when the call of Jesus that Follow me, you got to hate your father and your mother and your, bro- your, your brother and your sister and your wife and even your own life. Jesus saying that to say that the allegiance that we give to him must be greater than any other relationship in our life. This is what he's, he's worthy of that. And so the psalmist is saying, I am going to Jerusalem and possibly may face danger because I'm obeying Jesus. Before we move on, can I just ask you this question? Where are you looking to for help? I think in America sometimes we look to ourselves, we look to our works, we look to even our religion, we look to our money, we look to our possessions, we look to our job, we even look to our family or our career. And these are the things that we are saying, help me, help me, help me. I'm writing a paper right now on a certain aspect of uh, Tibetan Buddhism for school about how a a ritual, how people put trust in a ritual. I was in a monastery one time uh, up in the, uh, the east side of India um, kind of near the, the China and, and Bhutan border. And I remember looking, she was 75 or 80 years old, this lady sitting in a room in this massive prayer wheel, and she was turning the prayer wheel clockwise over and over and over and over again because she thought by doing that, by turning this prayer wheel, she would get merit. She would basically expedite her way to liberation, to nirvana, By the works of her hand, she could deliver herself. And let me just tell you, there is only one mountain that we look to that provides forgiveness and reconciliation and salvation. It is Mount Calvary. It is where the Lord Jesus went and paid for our sins with the work of his hands. And when we look for deliverance in things around us, we will despair. We look to the mountain of what the culture holds high. We look to the mountain of what... Uh, people around us hold high. We think that we can find our security in what we do. We don't find security in what we do. We find security in who we are. And who we are as children of God is solely on the basis of what Jesus has done for us. So he admits his need. As we move on in the psalm, I want you to see secondly that our limits and weaknesses do not affect God's ability to keep us. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. Notice that the human being has many problems. Their feet slip. Or let's just say it this way. Our feet slip. This year at uh, at Southern Miss Baseball, out in in the, the roost, Ben Wimpigler can, can verify this also. There's a pine tree, and there was like a rolling number chart. Because out in the roost, there's a little decline, and they put gravel out there. They didn't pave it, because you don't want it to be 100,000 degrees off the pavement when you're sitting watching baseball. So there's gravel there. And what happened was, every time somebody would slip on the, on the gravel, somebody would go down there and turn another number. At the end of the season, it was like 200 people that had slipped on the gravel. Some of you would be like, well, you know, power five, we could afford something else. To the top, baby. That's all I got to say, all right? We are prone to slip, aren't we? That's us. 
We are people that slumber and sleep. Right? Many of us sleep, but our eyes are open. We're awake, but what are we? We, we sleep. We are people who have limits. Our feet slip. Our eyelids droop. God made us that way. God did not rest on the Sabbath because he needed a time out. He needed a breather. God rested on the Sabbath to remind us, to organize our life that we have to rest. I mean, a third of our life, right? I know, I know nobody here sleeps eight hours. I mean, it's kind of impossible in this age. Some people are like, dude, I sleep 10 hours. Double thumbs up to you. But if you think about it, 24-hour day, like a third of it, you know, a third of your life you'll spend sleeping, right? You know? Why? Because the Lord is saying, you have limits. You will run up against a wall called the end of yourself. And if you don't stop, guess what? Your body will stop you. Hopefully, it's just for like a couple days where you need rest. Not, not just because you're burned out at 35, right? Because you don't sleep. Then there's this other thing. There's the sun. There's the heat. We need shade. What I find in this text is that the psalmist takes his eyes off himself. Someone who has limits and weaknesses and then looks to the one who has no limits and who has no weaknesses. And guess what? Because of my inability, my inability and my limits don't affect his ability at all one bit. You know why you need to sleep? Because God doesn't. You know why you need to hang on? Because God already has the grip. He's the rock that shall not be shaken. He will not let your foot be moved. He will not slumber. He does not sleep or slumber. Notice what he says also, he who keeps Israel. I'm thankful that it's not just us individually that have limits and weaknesses. Guess what? <laughs> All of us together, you put us together, sure we have talents and abilities, but guess what? You throw us all together, and there is like obvious massive weaknesses. It's like our weaknesses magnify when we get together, right? Guess what? The Lord's enough. He can keep one person by himself. He can keep two people by himself. He can keep billions of people by, by himself. You know why? Because he's God. He not only keeps us individually, he keeps us corporately. I wanted to read this verse. You can just write it down in your notes. Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah, as he often did, talking about idolatry in the nation of Israel. Listen to what he says. Jeremiah chapter 10 Verse 5, their idols, the gods of the nations, their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. And they cannot speak, and they have to be carried. They cannot walk. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Ne Neither is it in them to do good. The contrast, there is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your due. For among all the wise ones of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. Our God doesn't need to take a break. He doesn't need a nap. Remember what happened on Mount Carmel with the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal? The Hebrews is real, real fun there. <laughs> hey, hey is, is Baal in the bathroom? Is he, a, is he taking a nap? Where is he? One small prayer in faith and then fire fell. Why? Because the Lord is the living and true God. You know what's so encouraging about that story? Elijah faces like 850 prophets and then Jezebel says one word and then he runs to the wilderness. Like he faced 850 and he ran away from one queen. Guess what? Even the greatest men of God in the scripture had limits and weaknesses and guess what? The same God held them up. He'll hold you as well. I thought this was funny too. Verse six. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. It's like, dude, when did the moon ever like strike people? You know? Moonstruck. 
and, and what's probably, the psalmist is like, this is a little sarcastic, this is what I like. There are rational fears in our life, the sun striking us, right? Sun, sunstroke's a real deal, right? Being moonstruck is not. God will keep you from everything that is legitimately you have to worry about. And guess what? God is greater than even the things that really can't ever happen to you anyway. We have irrational fears in our life. What, 80% of the time with the stuff we worry about never even comes true? Guess what? God keeps that too. He's the God of the actual. He's the God of the hypothetical. And he's the God of what will never happen. I'm going to ask you another question this morning. Do you believe God's promises to keep you? Do you believe that he doesn't sleep? Do you believe that he doesn't slumber? Third truth. And then I want to do a little application. These last two verses. God will fulfill his purposes for our life by keeping us. The Lord, three times here, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. So there's a promise that he's going to keep us from evil. We might say that that is a, a spiritual protection. We might say that the Lord is the one who has saved us, continues to save us, and will save us. He's the one, as Justin told us last week, we've been saved from the penalty of sin. We're being saved from the power of sin in this life. One day we'll be saved from the presence of sin. He will keep us from all evil. But then he says, he will keep your life. Some of your translations say he will keep your soul. The Hebrew there, nephesh, it's the whole person. It, it's, it's not just your body. It's, it's not just a physical protection. It's a mental protection. It's an emotional protection. He will keep you. He will guard you. He is watching over you. And then the totality statement in verse 8, whether you're going out or whether you're coming in, from right now to forevermore, guess what? He will keep. A commentary that, that I use a lot, a little commentary on the Psalms by an old British guy named Derek Kidner. This is what he says. It would be hard to decide which half of verse 8 is more encouraging. The fact that it starts, God's protection, from now, as the text says, or that it runs on, not to the end of time, but without end. So, choose your own adventure. You're worried about right now? Guess what? He's keeping you right now. You're worried about tomorrow? It's, he's going to keep keeping you. you know, not, not just at the end of this life. For forevermore. That is the promise of God to his people. He will keep us. I love what Spurgeon says here. He, he makes note of the three keeps. We'll keep you from all evil. We'll keep your life. We'll keep your going out and your coming in. Spurgeon says, three times we have the phrase, Jehovah shall keep. As if the sacred trinity thus sealed the word to make it sure. Ought not all our fears to be slain then by such a threefold flight of arrows? What anxiety can survive this triple promise? This keeping is eternal, continuing from this time forth even forevermore. What does God the Father tell you? I'll keep you. What does the Son tell you? I'm with you to the end of the age. What does the Spirit say? I am here in you forever as the Spirit of truth. As we think about this psalm, you know, something that happens in, in India sometimes, the, the, the believers will get somewhere and they'll pray and they'll thank God. And I mean, it wasn't like we took like a, a 15 our flight. It was like we took a five minute down the street. And you know what they said? They said, Lord, thank you that you brought us and you kept us. But it wasn't that big of a deal. It was like five minute motorcycle ride through the city. No. I think sometimes outside of America, they have a greater sense of the keeping of God than we do because we trust our seatbelts. We trust our society. If you don't trust your seatbelt, please trust your seatbelt, okay? Please put it on. We, we trust our, our retirement accounts. And, and it seems as if 
those in the world that don't have much to their name realize that God uses different things for protection, but ultimately he is the one doing the protection. All your goings out, all your comings in. How do we apply this? Because I want to acknowledge this. As you read this, some of you are saying, yeah, but, but he didn't do that in my situation. Isn't that the awkwardness sometimes we read passages like this? But he didn't heal my dad. But he didn't bring my parents back together. But I've, I'm still battling this disease. Or my finances are still jacked up. Or how come I can't reconcile with that person and they continue to hate me? Hear from our brothers and sisters in, in Myanmar that are in the middle of a civil war. Just a few weeks ago, I got an email that a dear child of God going out sharing the gospel was killed. That had worked with some people that we helped there. Can I just make a few statements? They won't be on the screen. I just want you to listen. Let me just get the obvious one out of the way. Sometimes we're not protected from certain things because of our disobedience. Sometimes we do dumb things and we suffer the consequences. Right? And why does God discipline us? Because he loves us. Those I love, I rebuke. That's what he says. And when I see this psalm, I, I say what's built into it is that the psalmist is responding in obedience. One commentator said, if we take our eyes off the source of our assurance, when we look to other mountains for help, then the mundane, the ordinary, the sun, the moon, the malicious things will often find us and strike us. Thus may we always be reminded to lift up our eyes to the Lord. That's the truth. Sometimes the things in our life that we face, guess what? They are consequences for choices that we make. Now let me go to the complete opposite end of that. Because by saying that, I don't want you to put that shoe on if it doesn't apply to you, okay? But, but some of us, possibly it does apply to. Let's not blame God for our sin, right? He's not the author of sin. But let me go to the complete opposite direction. Sometimes God, although we are faithful and obedient to him, allows difficult situations to happen to us. The book of Job, right? Do you know what I love in the book of Job? It, it's like Satan's looking for somebody to mess with and, and the Lord like recommends Job. Have you considered my servant Job? It was like Satan didn't even know about this dude in the land of us that was righteous and blameless and walked with God, right? But you know what God said? You can mess with him, but you're only going to go this far. No more. Did you know this? For anything to happen in the life of a Christian, God has to sign the parental consent form for it to happen. That's comforting. Nothing catches him by surprise. And sometimes God allows difficult situations to happen to us. Hosea 6.1 even says that sometimes God injures his children to heal them. To, to bring us closer to him. Third, I think sometimes God allows storms to happen in our life to protect us from a bigger storm. You know, one time in, in the Gospels, Jesus sent the disciples out into the middle of a storm. They didn't know it was coming. He knew it was coming. And he gets on the mountaintop, and he just sits there and prays. And, he's, he, and as the night goes on and the storm gets worse, like he's watching them. It's almost like, what a cruel master. Send them into the storm. Watch them just kind of work through the storm, and I'm just going to sit up here and pray. I think Jesus sent them into a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee so they wouldn't live in the storm of pride and egotism on the shore thinking they were the ones that healed all the people and multiplied all the food. And it, Jesus wanted them to, to send them away from that. And then he finally did come to them on the shore, I mean, on, in, the, in the storm, but only when they, it seems as if they had exhausted their strength. Check this out. Sometimes God allows you to experience these things in your life because he is ultimately protecting you from something far worse. I think one of the 
glories in heaven, we may spend one million years worship him in just this respect. All the times God protected us when he didn't seem as if he was protecting us, but he was actually protecting us far more than what we thought. All the unconscious things that we never knew that God protected us from, and guess what? He was doing it the whole time. But I will just say this. Sometimes we just don't know why things happen. We just don't. But your circumstances never negate God's goodness. We can read this psalm, and if we know him, we are part of his covenant people. We have placed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have experienced the love of God. The Holy Spirit lives in us. These promises are true. He will keep us. He will hold us fast. Michael Tress got excited this morning because I walked in with a, one of the Chronicles of Narnia. And I'm one of those Narnia nerds, like I put them in the right order in which C.S. Lewis wrote them, not this mixed up garbage they've got now. Anyway, this is one that called The Horse and His Boy. It's actually book five. They have book three. They're wrong. It's a story of a young boy who has a tough life, lost his parents, was raised by a cruel master. And it seems as if everything in his life, spoiler alert, so fine, it was written like 60 years ago. If you hadn't read it, you should have already read it by now. All right. <clears throat> and he experiences all these bad things. And, and there's one kind of constant in the middle. There's always something around, something chasing him, or he, he notices uh, 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 what he thinks is a pack of lions, and then a lion's chasing him and, and injures his friend. And then there's another time where he just, all these things pile up, and he's just thinking, everything in my life is wrong. And then one night he's riding by himself in the woods, and he notices someone is close to him, and he gets very scared. And C.S. Lewis wrote this. The boy asked, are you, are you a giant? The large voice answered back, you might call me a giant. I can't see you at all. You're not something dead, are you? Please go away. What harm have I ever done to you? I'm the unluckiest person in the whole world. Once more, he felt the warm breath of whatever it was on his hand and his face. There it said, see, that's not the breath of a ghost. Tell me all your sorrows. Don't you think it was bad luck so many times to meet many lions? The voice said, there was only one lion. What on earth do you mean? I've just told you about all my problems. There were two lions on that one first night. The boy had told about escaping after escape after escape. How do you know there was only one lion? The voice said, I was the lion. I was the lion who forced you to join with your friend. I was the cat who comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you while you slept. I was the lion who gave the horses the new strength of fear so that you would reach where you needed to in time. And I was the lion that you do not even remember pushed the boat in which you lay a child near death so that you would be received by another man. It was you who wounded my friend. It was I. But what for? Child, the voice said, I'm telling you your story, not theirs. I tell no one any story but his own. Who are you? The boy asked. The voice said, myself. Very deep and low so that the earth shook. And again, myself, loud and clear. And then the third time, myself, whispered so softly you could hardly hear it. The boy was no longer afraid then that the voice belonged to something that would eat him, nor was it the voice of a ghost. But a new different and sort of trembling came over him, and he felt glad too. He turned and saw, pacing beside him, taller than his horse, was a lion. The horse did not seem to be afraid. A light came from the lion. No one had ever seen anything more beautiful or terrible. He was seeing Aslan, the great lion, the son of the emperor over the sea, the king above all high kings in Narnia. And one glance at the lion's face, the boy slipped out of the saddle and fell at its feet. He couldn't say anything. But then he didn't want to say anything, and he knew he didn't say anything. It could be the times in your life that you thought you were being attacked, that you thought you were being chased, was actually this living and true God keeping you. 
And in response to such a great God, perhaps we just need to get off our high horse and fall at his feet and say, you're the king. I need your help. I trust your promises. And even though I may get to the end of it and just say, I don't know. I know this. One thing I do know. You are God. And you're good. As summer wraps down and our normal lives pick back up, as life gets more busy and life gets more hectic, he will keep his own. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Scripture. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that the road that you call us to may be difficult, may be hard, may be perilous, but you're going to keep us because you promised. So Lord, I pray for us today that might be looking to other mountains, to mountains of this world, to mountains of earth, that we'll look to you who made all these things. God, I pray for those that have never looked to Christ for salvation and help, that you'll make them aware of their great need, convict and call them to yourself. But God, for your children, that you watch over us and keep us and protect us because you love us and you have set your love upon us. Lord, we pray you minister our hearts. As we sit before the Lord, church, just as we sit in silent prayer, think about his word. How has he spoken to your heart today? Maybe there needs to be a raising of the eyes, not to what's surrounding you, but to this king on the throne. Maybe just an admission, Lord, I need your help. I don't want to look to the things of this world. I want to look to you. Maybe this morning you don't know this great God. We'd love to talk to you, share the gospel with you, how you can know him. In just a moment, we're going to stand and worship our God. If you need prayer, you need to talk to somebody, Justin and I will be at the back of the room on either side. Maybe you're struggling. You just need somebody to pray for you. We'd love to do that. We also have ladies available to be able to share with you ladies if you need to talk to a lady. But maybe this morning as we worship, just to raise our hands and our voices and acknowledge that our help only comes from this great God. So stand. Let's worship. Let's praise him, the God who keeps us. Daniel, lead us as we sing.